Hey everybody, in today's tutorial, I'm going to show you how you can use Gulp 4 in your website workflow. Gulp is a great tool that you can use to compile your SAS and your JavaScript files. And the best part is, once you set it up and you save all your settings in a Gulp file, you can simply reuse that file in all your future website projects. Sound good? Let's get into it. So to start working with Gulp, the first thing you need to do is to make sure that you have Node installed on your computer. If you don't have it, you can easily go to nodejs.org and install whichever version you need for your operating system. Once you have that installed, then we can start setting up Gulp. Okay, so let's go to our code editor here. I'm using VS Code for my editor, and what I have open is just kind of an empty folder, just has an index.html file. But let's just go down to this terminal section here. And the first thing we want to do now is to install the Gulp CLI, the command line utility. And we're going to install that globally on our computer. And it's called gulp-cli. And what gulp-cli does is it allows you to run gulp commands on your command line. Also, if you need to use different versions of gulp in different website projects, you can kind of manage all those um, as well. So it's pretty handy to have. OK, once gulp's installed, we want to add our package.json file so we can install all the other NPM packages that we need. So to do that, we'll just do npm init, and I do dash y, so it answers yes to all the questions. And then we have our just kind of simple package.json file. All right, now let's install all the different packages that we want. We can install multiple packages at the same time. So we're going to run npm install, save dev. So each package will be saved as a dev dependency in our package.json. And we'll add all the packages here. So we'll start out with gulp, because we need gulp, of course. Then we'll do gulp sass. That will be the actual one that compiles your sass to CSS files. Gulp source maps, which will map your CSS file, your CSS styles back to your original sass files so you can find it easier. And then we'll run, we'll add post CSS, gulp post CSS, which in conjunction with other plugins like auto prefixer and CSS nano, will run different things on your CSS files. Auto prefixer adds the vendor prefixes to your CSS, and then CSS nano simply minifies your CSS files. Then we're going to add our JavaScript packages. So we want gulp concat to concatenate or combine your JavaScript files into one. Then we want gulp uglify to minify your JavaScript files. And then lastly, we're going to use a plugin called gulp replace, and we'll use that to um, add a query string in our index.html file to help with cache busting. So we got all those added, and let's install those. OK, everything's been added. And you can see in the package.json file, all these different packages are now listed. OK, now that our modules are added, let's put them to work in our gulp file. So we're going to go back to our code editor here and create a new file called gulp file. JS. And in this file, we're going to add in all the tasks that we're going to be running in Gulp. Let's start out in our Gulp file by adding in all the different things that we want to do. So up at the top, we want to kind of import all the NPM packages as modules. So we'll, up here, we'll initialize the modules. Then after that, we're going to um, add in some variables. This is so we don't need to keep retyping the same thing over and over. After that, we're going to run all our different gulp tasks. So we'll have our sass task to compile our sass files, JavaScript task to concatenate and minify our JavaScript files. Then we want our cache busting task. So you don't need to clear your cache every time you make a CSS or JavaScript change. Then after that, we're going to do a watch task. Um, and what that means is that once you run gulp, you will be able to It'll automatically be able to detect any changes you make to your files, and it'll automatically rebuild everything. So you don't need to type in the gulp command every time you make a single change. Then after that, at the bottom, we're going to have our default task. And this is kind of the main gulp task that when you type it into the command line, it'll run everything for you. So these are the different parts that we're going to have in our gulp file. OK, let's just start at the top and move our way down. So the first thing we're going to do is initialize modules. And what this step is doing is essentially we are importing 
And let me just move that over there so we can see both. We're importing the NPM packages that we installed as variables in our gulp file. And that lets us access all the functions and everything associated with those packages. So we'll create a constant and we'll just kind of start from the top auto prefixer um, equals require auto prefixer. So it's, it's a little bit tedious, but we just need to add in everything like this. Um, so then we'll CSS nano. Okay, that's all done. And one actually, one other thing we're going to do is for gulp, we're going to actually explicitly import each of the actual gulp functions that we need to use. So that way, for example, there's a function called source. So instead of having to type gulp.source, we can just type source if we import them explicitly. But honestly, this is really just a preference thing. Um, it's up to you what you'd like to do. You know, you're gonna have to type it in somewhere. So we have all our sort of standard gulp um, functions that we were using, you know, source, destination, uh, watch, and then series and parallel are two new ones that you may not have seen before if you haven't used gulp4 yet. Um, they are used in creating the tasks that we're running later on. And you'll see the new syntax and I'll go through all of that. But for now, these are all the different packages that we're going to be using in our tasks. Next up, we're going to create some variables that we can reuse in this gulp file. So we'll add another constant and we're going to make more than one variable. So I'm actually going to add a little array here and we're going to save our paths as variables. So we want our SCSS path and I'll show you this a bit later, but we're going to have an app folder with an SCSS subfolder. Then we're going to add a little glob here in case we create any more subfolders. And then that's going to be any file that ends in SCSS. And we'll do the similar thing for our JavaScript path here. So it'll be an app JS with a glob and dot JS, any dot JS file. So this is helpful because then you don't need to keep rewriting stuff. Okay, now for the fun part, let's create our first task. So we're going to do, we're going to create our SAS task here, and we're going to do that by creating a function called SCSS task. Yes, very creative, I know. Um, and the first thing we want to do is we're going to add a return statement here, and then we're going to sort of one by one add in every step of this task that we want to use. The first one is source, because we need to tell Gulp where to find our SAS files. And in the source, we're going to add that new um, variable files.scss path so that it knows where to find our SAS files. Then after that, every successive step, we're going to use the pipe function that Gulp lets you, that Gulp has to let you um, add on multiple um, steps in your tasks. So after the source, we want to first initialize our source maps. And you want to do that before you run um, your SAS your SAS function. So after source maps are initialized, we're going to add another pipe and then compile our SAS files to, S to CSS files. Then after that, um, we're going to run the other plugins, the auto prefixer, as well as the CSS nano. And those are run under post CSS. So we'll add our post CSS here. Then we're going to run auto prefixer as well as CSS nano. So then our files will have the proper vendor prefixes as well as get minified. So after this step, we essentially have created the CSS file that we wanted. So we can then finish our source maps and um, write the actual source maps file. And we just wanna keep it in the same directory. So we'll do that. And then after that, we're gonna take all our final files and set the destination of them. So what we want to do is we're going to create um, a dist folder and that's where we're going to keep all our final CSS and JavaScript files. So that is done. Oops, that is done here. And I'm just going to indent it that way. And that's our SAS task. So 
we're going to use the same basic steps for a JavaScript task as well. So we'll say function, we'll just call this JS task. And then we're going to do the same thing, add a little return statement. And then we're going to add in all the different parts of this that we need. So source again, we'll use our files.js path for our source. Um, and then we will add a, oh, is that right? I think I did something wrong here. There we go. We'll add a pipe. And then after we get our JavaScript files, we want to concatenate, you know, if we have multiple files into one. So we'll use our concat. And then in the concat, we are going to write in the final file name that we want. So it's going to be all.js. You can name it whatever you want. Then after that, we will do uglify. And then there's not as many steps with our JavaScript as we had with our SAS, but at the end, we'll do again, the destination set as the dist folder. So there we have our main tasks. All right, for our cache busting task, let's go through what exactly we want to happen. So in our index.html file, let me open that here. We have our CSS reference up at the top. And then at the bottom of the file, we have our JavaScript reference. And you can see that I've already kind of added this query string of CB equals one, two, three for both of those. The reason that we want that is that your browser will automatically cache or locally save um, file assets such as CSS files, JavaScript files, and images, things like that. And one downside of that is that if you make a CSS or JavaScript change and you push it up to your website and you reload it in the browser, um, it will not, the browser won't automatically load the new version of the file unless something's changed or you sort of tell it to not cache. So one way that you can kind of get around that is by adding a query string. And if, if the query string changes, the browser sort of assumes that that's a new file. So they'll reload, they'll refresh the file from the server. So the way that cache busting works is that we're going to have this number string one, two, three, and every time we run gulp, we want that string to change to some different number. You can make it a random number. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to um, change it to a number based on the current time in milliseconds. So it'll be kind of like this long number string. So let's go back to our gulp file and kind of make that happen. So for a cache busting task, we're going to do the same thing we did before, create a function. We'll call this cache bus task. And then we're going to have a return statement and um, add a source value of index.html because that's the file that we want to affect. So once we have our index.html file, we're going to use, um, after we add the pipe, we're going to use the gulp replace plugin. And that plugin basically lets you find a certain string and then replace that string with a different string. So we'll say replace. And then <clears throat> what we want to do is we want to find anything that says CB equals any number. So it could be one, two, three, it could be any kind of number. And to kind of have that sort of conditional um, ability, we need to use regular expressions or regex. So to denote a regex um, string, you start with a slash and then we're going to add in what we're looking for. So we're looking for something that starts with CB equals and then any number. And the way you can type that in is you do backslash D and that will search for any one, any one number. It's like one digit of a number. Um, but because we want the number to be, you know, any a long number of digits, we're also going to add a plus um, slash G for global. So that means that it'll kind of look for any number to, you know, kind of an nth number of digits. And then that's what we're looking for in the first parameter. And the second parameter is what we're going to replace it with. So we're going to replace it with CB equals, and then we're going to add in our string that we're going to change every time we run gulp. We'll just call that variable CB string. So after we replace the CB equals whatever number with CB with new number, then we'll just do pipe and then the destination of the index.html file we want it to stay in the same location. So we'll just do that. And that is our function. So then because we created this variable up here, we need to create a new one. 
to get the current date. So we'll say CV string equals new date. And then to format it into the milliseconds, we're going to say get time. So it says it gets the time value in milliseconds. So it's going to end up being this pretty long number. And that is our cache busting task. Okay, so we've created our SAS task, our JavaScript task, and now our cache busting task. And these three tasks are sort of the main um, utility tasks that's doing stuff when we're running Gulp. The next task we want to do is create our watch task. And this is going to monitor files that we want to detect any changes in. And then when any changes are made, it's going to run these tasks over again. So we'll do the same thing. We'll create a function. We'll call this watch task. And then in the watch task, we'll use the gulp watch function. And this watch function takes two, two parameters. The first one is the files that you want to monitor. And the second parameter is the tasks that you want to run if any changes are detected in those files. So the two types of files we want to watch are our SAS files and JavaScript files. And we'll use that array variable that we created up earlier. And we'll detect our files in our SAS path and our JavaScript path. So that's the first parameter. And then second, we want to run the tasks again that we created um, if any changes are detected. So to do this, we need to use some new gulp for syntax um, because any task that you run, you need to use either series or parallel functions, and these are new. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the parallel function, and that means anything in here is going to be run simultaneously. So the tasks we want to run are our SAS task and our JavaScript task. And then this means that they'll be run at the same time. And that is pretty much our watch task. The last thing we want to do is create our default task. And this is going to be what Gulp does when you just type in Gulp on the command line. It needs to be publicly accessible to the command line. So we're going to use the exports to export our default. Um, function. So in this default function, we're going to use another new function called series. So series in parallel are basically your two options for running gulp tasks in gulp4. Series means, as you might imagine, just running things one at a time, step by step. Parallel is, of course, running things simultaneously. So we're going to use series in this case. And the first thing we want in our series is to run these tasks, the parallel SAS task and JavaScript task that we had up here. So we're just going to copy and paste that as the first step in our series functions. Second thing we want to do is we want to run our cache bus task. And then we want to run the watch task that we created. OK, so just to go back over everything, when you type in gulp, it'll run this default task. And in the default task, it's going to run three things step by step. The first thing is it'll run the SAS task and JavaScript task at the same time. Then it'll run our cache busting task and replace that query string in the index.html file. And lastly, it'll run our watch task. And this watch task will continue to run as long as you have the project open. And it will detect any changes. And then if any changes are detected in these files, our SAS and JavaScript files, it will then run, rerun the SAS task and the JavaScript task. And those are the basic steps of how Gulp works. So this is pretty much done with, we're done with our Gulp file now. Let's go back into our website project and kind of build out the files that we need in order to run Gulp and just make sure everything works. So if we look at what we had before, um, you might remember that we had this app folder that we wanted to put all our SAS and JavaScript files in. And then we also ended up using this dist folder um, as a destination for the final compiled files. So we haven't created those yet. So let's do that now. So in our root, we're just going to create a folder called app. Then we're going to create another folder called dist. Then in our app folder, we're going to create some subfolders. So we're going to create one for our SAS file and then another one for our JavaScript files. And for each of those, we're also going to just build out, um, 
create the files that we need. So in our SAS folder, we'll just say style.scss. And then in our JavaScript folder, we'll create a file called script.js. Okay, so in our SAS folder, or in our SAS file, rather, let's just add some kind of general um, styles so that we can, you know, test things out. So one thing I usually do um, when I'm writing my styles is you want to set your box sizing property to border box. And this just kind of ensures that the, the width and height of elements will include any padding that you create. So padding is not going to add things in addition to um, the width. We also want to set our font size to 100%. And then we want to kind of have every element in the website sort of inherit that box sizing property from the HTML. So we'll say box sizing and inherit. Okay, let's create our body tag or body property, I suppose. Um, we'll just add some general global padding just to kind of give things some more space. Let's also add um, a background color of light gray of some sort. We're gonna also set our text color to, let's just do black, keep things simple. And then if you remember in our index.html file earlier, we I added a Google fonts for Roboto. So let's add that in as well. So font family. Roboto, and then if Roboto doesn't load for whatever reason, we'll have a fallback. We'll just do the sans serif. Um, and then I also do like a line height. I like to just set that kind of globally to add space by default. Cool. Um, let's see what else we got here. Okay, so I have my body tag. I also had a main tag with content. So let's just do... Um, main. So I think what I'm going to do is the body, the default background color is going to be gray, but the main content, let's make that white. Um, also add some padding in there too. Um, and then let's see what else we got. I think that's okay for now. Um, we're really just trying to test things out here. So let's go into our script.js file and we'll just add a console log hello world. And then we'll just make sure that that's working. Cool. So we have our files here that are ready for gulp. Let's see if it works. Type in gulp on the command line. All right. Looks like everything's working. So if we look back, um, it sort of tells you a record of what it did. So it's starting the default task. Then it's starting the SAS task and JavaScript task at the same time. You can see a little timestamp there. Um, it finishes the JavaScript and the SAS task. And then it's running that cache busting task, you know, just one millisecond after that. And then running the watch task. So right now the watch task is currently running. Let's go back into our index.html file, see if things changed. Okay, so if you remember, we had that CB equals one, two, three. That's now been replaced by, you know, a long text string referring to the number of milliseconds that we got. And the same thing down here. And let's see if that page loads when we open it in the browser. So let's open a new window here. And we're going to just load the index.html file. <laughs> looks like that has a preview. Um, okay, and it looks like our styles have definitely been ported over and they're successfully loading up in here. Um, so yeah, this is great. You can see in the uh, developer tools, if we click on an element, you can see that it tells you the SAS file and the line number that the original style came from. So this is super helpful when you have, you know, a whole bunch of styles and maybe multiple SAS files and you just want to see where something's coming from so you can quickly make any changes. Um, let's actually test one more thing. We just want to make sure that the watch task is actually successfully rerunning any um, styles that we have. So Let's just replace that text color in the body with red and save. And you can see when I hit save, it did rerun everything. Um, it looks like, looks pretty good. Um, let's just try this as well. 
I'll just change the background color to black just for the sake of it. Okay, and it's rerunning again. Now let's go back to our website, make sure the changes went through. We're gonna reload. And yeah, we got a black background and red text. So that's pretty much it. I'm just gonna undo these changes here. If you like to, you can actually check out the code for this. Um, I have a GitHub repository called Front End Boilerplate. So if you go to github.com slash the coder coder, I have a repository, Front End Boilerplate, and you can see all the files here. There's some instructions. And I really just made this project for myself to be kind of a set of starter files when I'm making new website projects. But, you know, of course, you're more than welcome to check them out. You're welcome to clone it and use it for your own projects. So I hope you found this Sculpt 4 tutorial helpful. Um, yeah, if you like the video, feel free to like it or leave a comment below. And yeah, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.